um, yeah, that's what I thought at the moment. <laughs> My lecture. <laughs> Um, I'm Aisha, I'm currently working uh, as an active facilitator at Landmark Education and Training. I'm Deandra, I work as Learning and Participation Administrator at Birmingham Rep. I'm Hugh, and I'm a drama teacher. That's many other things. Yeah. <laughs> but it would take about half an hour for you to explain everything you yeah. do. Um, <laughs> before I get started on a long list of questions that I have, uh, we do have a prize for the best question asked by somebody today. So has anyone got a question for our panel to start us off? Or shall I start? You start. Shall I? Yeah. Yeah. Let's give it time. Yeah. All right. Let's start with something just really simple. Uh, why is arts education crucial to young people? You can ask each one of them, yeah. So does anyone like to volunteer to start? Or? We didn't draw lots. in their mind to make them go, oh God, that's it, Eureka, you know. So that's what I think, why we, why the art, arts education is, is, is so vital. And I get very frustrated when people say that skills like esteem and skills that, and qualities like um, confidence and uh, discipline are kind of classed as soft skills, when in fact I think they're the hardest skills to, to develop. I don't know if you ever master them, you know. There's no kind of... Um, exact science involved in there. So I think that's why, to me, art education is, is really, really important. So. I'd agree. I think if you, if you look at people's lives and the way that we live, there's so many instances where arts has informed the enjoyment that people get out of life. So people go to the cinema, or they go to a gallery, or they'll listen to music, or watch TV. There's so many instances where that happens and it just brings people joy. Mm -hmm. and so not having it in education where we're setting up young people for the future, where does that appreciation come? Where does that developing those skills so that they could on a very low level enjoy playing the piano if they want to, or on a high level be part of these careers in the future. So yeah, that's that to me is why it's very important. Um I think at its basis arts is the most engaging way to educate um, because even if you have the quietest of person at school who doesn't get involved much they're always going to want to know what's going on uh, when it comes to arts whether that's a play whether it's a song like they just can't help but get engaged um, and obviously education is so important in itself so in order to educate you need that engagement you, you need them to want to learn um, and I think the arts does that. Yeah, you know, <coughs> two, two things I'll say, um, and I'll try and keep it concentrated. Um, I mean, it seems to me that in that question, one has to ask oneself, what do we mean by education and what, we, what is art? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then two huge questions, I'm not actually going to go down there, uh, I, I think. Um, the first thing that strikes me following what DeAndre was saying there, um, 
when I used to say, throughout the whole history of humanity, there has been some form of art, storytelling, drama, and we, we, you know, in the West, talk about certain particular ages, and you know, we talk about Renaissance and Shakespeare, etc., 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 and then we say, oh, yeah, but that's not important. And one has to ask oneself, well, how come we've been doing this since, in fact, we could call ourselves human beings? Um, so that's one thing to, to kind of just sort of note, really. The other thing that strikes me as someone who's worked in drama and theatre and education um, is that actually what, our, what theatre and drama do particularly, it's probably different from music, um, is that it creates uh, the material and the, and the um, conditions in which we can reflect on what it is to be human. Yeah. And we do that because quite a very, very simple thing, but it's actually a little bit of a, you know, why do we do this? But we create another. So I, when I'm involved in a drama, either as an audience or as a participant, as a young person, I experience a, a situation through another. So Hamlet, you know, um, he's the injustice, he's, his father's been killed and he's been, you know, his dilemma, I am experiencing through him. Yeah. And in doing that, through that other, um, I, be, I, I can know myself, if you like, yeah. and my situation. So You connect, don't you? you uh, yeah, you yeah. connect with them, but you connect within yourself as well, don't you? Absolutely. And you bring all you know about, it. that's why some of these kids who are quiet, can't help themselves at speaking drama because you you have to bring everything you know about life to name it or say well that's what's going on there or you know I think that's wrong. You know. That's it. We're going somewhere a lot simpler now. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how, how did you get to where you are now and why do you stay there? So what's your your journey been? That's simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first time, I feel like mine's probably yeah. the easiest because it's, it's the newest, no offence. Um, <laughs> um, so I did drama basically at school, at secondary school, um, continued to do it at A level because I knew I had a passion for it. Didn't know whether I was going to actually have any kind of career in it, I just knew that I liked drama. I also did health and social care and I just really liked that thought of using drama, using the arts and performance to help people, as simple as that. And I was like, how do I even do that? And then I came across what it was called, which was Applied Performance Community and Education um, course in 2014. I thought, why not? Let's just have a go, see how it goes. Um, and then I graduated from there in 2017. Um, and then I didn't really know what I was doing for a bit because it's quite hard to find a job straight away. And then I was lucky enough to come across an opportunity at Loudmouth um, because they were looking for like a temporary person um, from about October to December to um, kind of cover someone. But then that person never came back and I got a job there. Um, <laughs> permanently, which obviously is sad for them, not for me. Um, and <laughs> um, but they're in a better place now. They're at the, you know, the mentally, mental health and stuff um, meant that they it wasn't the right place for them to be at the right time, but for me, it just meant that I was able to progress, and I'm still with them now. So yeah, basically from the applied performance course, because I think without that, I wouldn't have got the job I'm in now. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Deandra, or Jeremy? Jeremy. Jeremy. Wow, okay. Um, school, I always loved arts. Um, I started playing cello when I was five, um, and then dabbled a little bit in drama drama teacher that I really didn't like and then went back to music um, and then decided music was where I wanted to be. I always wanted to be a teacher. So went to uni and then did my PGC and became a music teacher. And it's like, this is all I've ever dreamed it would be. And this is so exciting and now I get to enrich young people's minds with music and inspire them and create things. It's all going to be fantastic. Um, and yeah, I 
this year less teaching um, just because of five years in. Because for me, the way the education system, well, I can only speak from the school that I was in, but I know a lot of teachers feel the same way. It's just really not conducive to young people, mm. develop their development, teach them mental health, um, mm. making them well-rounded human beings, supporting them. The, the balance is all off for me. Um, and I think the students and the teachers are the people that are suffering the most and not senior management. Mm. Um, so I was looking around to see in probably 2014, what could else can I do? I didn't really have a plan B, which is not like me. So I had a little bit of like a quarter life crisis. Um, <laughs> and then kind of thought, well, I like organizing things and I like color coding and being really like crazy like that. <laughs> so I decided to maybe I could organize events and like organize um, parties or festivals. So I started to look at different programs. I did Project Sound Lounge at Town Hall Symphony Hall. Um, I did Southside Producers with Beat Freaks um, and just developed and found out a lot more that nobody was really interested to me. I didn't know what the word producer really meant or that there were so many different layers to organising events and arts events and that there were so much different capabilities, like outdoors or theatre space, site specific. Um, so I really like came into my own becoming a producer and that all those experiences got me to this year a full-time job at the REC in the learning participation team and I'm really enjoying it and yeah it's still stressful <laughs> but a different kind of stress from teaching. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah so uh, I left school in 1979 <coughs> the year Margaret Thatcher was elected um, with, with a very poor <laughs> set of GCSEs, uh, well, CSEs as they were then, um, and then GCSEs. I had five, and I've got grade three in drama, which is uh, disgraceful. And, um, <laughs> what, what is it disgraceful? Oh, because, yeah, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> well, I went straight to drama school. I went straight to drama school at 16. I went to East 15. Um, and then that, I went there for a year, and... Uh, I left there and had a year sort of doing other things and then um, got into Rose Bruford and did the community theatre arts course. Now, that is kind of what we now call applied theatre. And it was the only one in the country. Um, and we were trained in, you know, community theatre, uh, TIE, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we went out into the community, we did plays and we, you know, that sort of thing as part of our training. So, <coughs> And it's really, I mean, the thing to note about that is that sometimes I, I reflect back and think, well, crikey, what would I have done if I hadn't got into theatre and drama? What would, what would have happened to me? And I genuinely don't know and genuinely think, oh, my God, uh, there for the grace of God go away because, you know, you know uh, 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 yeah, who knows what could have happened. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, and I worked, I worked in lots of companies, and I got into TIE, and I really loved being in TIE. And I came here in '92. So it's on the paper. <laughs> I came here in '92. But the thing to the thing to say is, is I've always been on. I suppose how I've got here is I've always been on the wrong side of everything. So I've I've always been in the wrong place where they're giving out the money or something like that, <laughs> or you know. So when when we were really into theatre and education and we'd be in a school all day working in a participatory programme with one class of kids, you know, all of that was got rid of. You know, that was not cost effective. And, and my, so I ended up, um, in, well, I live in Sheffield, and I ended up in Sheffield working in a primary school as a teaching assistant. Um, uh, and, 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 and I, you know, and what the teachers were going through, and actually what the kids were going through as well, it was quite shocking, really. Um, and then I saw the job advertised here. I, I had taught at Newman University for a few years, um, but like I say, my family's in Sheffield, so it was too much of a pull. Um, and f what's really funny is I've come back, and I got the job, I really didn't expect to get the job here. I was thinking, well, uh, well just... You know, I'd had a really horrible time with, with trying to get work. And as a freelancer, it had all gone pear-shaped. And uh, I got the job here. And 
kind of came back, and it's kind of come back as a sort of little bit of a circle, working with Peter and Tarina, who I worked with in the 90s, at yeah, Big Brum. Um, so that was like, wow, coming back, and that's really kind of invigorated me again, because, you know, we're, we're able to work, talk about and be with the ideas and what it's about, rather than, you know, trying to um, just earn some money. Yeah. <coughs> um, so I, I, uh, I've always liked the arts, even as a, even as a, a kid and a very young kid. I did loads of plays when I was a kid and did youth theatre groups and went to youth theatre groups and um, and even ran one when I was when I was eighteen. So so uh, I left school at eighteen after doing my A levels and. Didn't face university. Wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, um, and uh, somebody, friends, friend of a friend, basically who was a youth worker at the time, said, "You know, um, I want to run. I know you're not going to university next year. I want to run a youth theatre group." I remember laughing very hard and saying something like, "That's going to be really hard. What are we, you know, that's going to be, you know, 18 years old going." Yeah. Um, they said, "No, no. I'll, I'll get the kids, and you do the drama and everything." And that's what we did. And so for two years. Ran a youth theatre group in the age of 18 to 20 in Winston Green called uh, Streetwise, which went really well. And then, but eventually, decided to go and then do my degree. So I did three years of Liverpool John Moores, finished in the mid 90s, um, and then came back and was like, I think, like you all pretty much intimated that whole what do I do now? It seems very much the kind of thing within arts, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, you get educated and educated and educated, but there's a point where you kind of suddenly go, I need to maybe do something a little bit more with this. So, um, <laughs> to the point that I actually remember a conversation with my mum, um, where I finished my degree, and I went, came back to Birmingham in, a week, in, in the next seven days, and I remember literally a conversation saying to her, hi mum, hi son, how are you? <coughs> Fine. Got any money? <coughs> no. Do you want to come home? Yes, weekend, mm, okay then, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, the decision to move back from Liverpool to Birmingham was made like that. So, come back to Brum, still not sure what to do. Did a play that a friend had directed, but still was in this, what do I want to do? And then um, went back into the drama youth work, did that for a while, and then an opportunity came up to be a teaching assistant at St Anne's School in Highgate. Um, so I did that for a year. And I started thinking, well, I keep hovering around the whole teaching thing. And my sister's a teacher. Um, she knows Todd, but she's a teacher. And so we're kind of like a bit, a bit of a family of teachers, really. There are other cousins and people that are teachers as well. So I thought this seemed to make sense because I think the acting profession perhaps is a little bit more precarious. And I questioned whether I had the confidence to go really go for it as contemporaries had tried. And sadly, you know, some of them, most of them failed. Um, so I thought I'm going to go down the teaching route. So I did my PGC and then I got my first job and I've been there at the same school for 20 years. So, you know, and just kind of. So that's how I got to where I got to, if that makes sense. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyone got any questions? I do. Before I leave, though, so I'm not even going to hear the answer, <laughs> but it's just a question. Because <laughs> we have to, to go see a play at the rep. So. Um, <laughs> but before I leave, the education system is really bad. So from what you guys are saying, and from my own experiences, I absolutely hate it. And there's so much that we can do to change. But if the education system has been so bad from such a long time, why haven't people changed it? And they're leaving it so that even the young ones now, the younger generations, are still suffering. I just feel like it's Time, going, timing. It's, it's just time, going down. It's, it's timing, so everything can be chaotic around you, but you're actually still, I'm all right in this, because at least I can use my skills to kind of work within it. And, it, and then it can be the adverse effect, kind of everything's flourishing, and you're going, I'm burnt out, and I'm going. So I think, you know, and, and certainly in my job, having seen so, I, I now actually can say, having seen so many changes within a school, history of the school going up and down, up and down, you pretty much kind of think to yourself, yeah, there's, there's still something in you that, that's still ticking, do you understand what I mean? And the education system we keep talking about, it does change, 
there have been periods where it has got better. It's just down to you as to whether you feel you have that strength to kind of carry it through. And if you don't, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. so that's my yeah. sense. That's my point of view. Yeah. I think in terms of art, I don't think there's enough people from top level government or advocating for mm -hmm. arts education uh, in a way that is meaningful and isn't just, oh, we'll make sure that we'll get a music teacher to come in for 20 minutes once a week and then that's all fine. Yeah, tick the box. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really needs to be. This is valuable to children. This is why they should be learning it and let's make sure that it's supported in the right way. But I don't think that's happened. I mean, there, there's, there's something that's happened that's really important in this because, I mean, the music services are decimated. In the, yeah, in the, in the 90s. And it's, 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 been again. it's criminal. Okay. criminal. What they've done, what, what it seems to me what politicians have done, uh, is, is, is commoditise, monetize education. And they're doing it in universities now. And if you look at what they call academies, and this is where it gets really difficult, is academies actually now are private concerns. Mm -hmm. So they've taken the education out of the public system, you know, and put it into private hands. So you don't actually even, what used to, you know, schools used to have all the governors and yeah. parents on it and all that. Now all of that's been, so actually it's very, it's, very, it's, it's frustratingly impossible to get at anything and change anything. And, and things seem to in, inexorably move in one direction. And even though I think if you sat down and talked to people and whatever, there are people like, well, yeah, you know. You can't get it anything. But can I say, it depends on the school you're going to as well. So if you, you, you can walk into a school and you can go, they go to the arts here, mm. can me or not, mm. and you can go, mm. well, I'm all right here. Mm. And if you ask the right questions at the right time, then you do little mm. things like, do you research, go into that school, and go on the day when they've got break duty. You know what I mean? It's mm. Just thinking outside mm. the box a little bit and how you approach it. Because there are hundreds of schools out there that are fantastic yeah. in the arts. You know, there are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Enjoy. Say, I mean, I mean, there are all kinds of, as, as people said, all kinds of sort of skills that come and, and qualities that come off of it. You know, I mean, if you you do gain a lot of confidence when you you know when you're involved in things like that, you um, uh, you you know you do you do learn you do enable yourself. You know, you you can create those things for yourself. But I think that what. I can't speak for the arts in general, so I don't speak for drama really. Um, it, it's a way of, you know, like I say, it's a way of being able to reflect on things in a sense. Because you create a situation, an imaginary situation, so actually you can be as extreme as you want with it. You can go into very dark places uh, because you create it, it's not actually happening in front of you. Um, and you can reflect on them in that sense. and. You know, that, that opens up things for you, doesn't it? And it, as it opens up things for you, you know, your, your horizons broaden, you're able to, you know, uh, what, what a curriculum that tells you that you, where, where you are learning instructions and how to follow instructions means at the end of the day, when you, when, if that's all you've got, what you can do is follow instructions. Mm. How can you have initiative? How can you have creativity? You know? Um, I don't know. The arts kind of offers the op well, opposite that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, you've got a more music background. How would you say that could help? Uh, for me, um, 
So there's so much evidence that art is, is so good for people's well-being, um, yeah. but I don't think that's been tested in enough. So various arts therapy, music therapy, art mm -hmm. therapy, drama therapy, um, and even just community engagement. So I know um, at the Rec we're doing so much work with developing communities, um, bridging divides between different groups, um, children with special educational needs. It's so it's an outlet for people to really express themselves. Um, yeah, that, that's what I think. There's, there's like a whole outside of mainstream education, art has so much applicable value to to life, um, mm. and that and that's in, in essence is the way that people should think about it. Not as in you go to a history lesson or a French lesson of we are going to learn these set of things. That art has so much wider context around it. The accessibility of it mm. is that everyone can be involved in the arts mm. in some way, and the arts can be catered to to them and their needs as well. Um, and it just allows people to have that, like you said, like the creative, um, creative input. But then also, what they get out of that is 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 big, and it has impact on them. I think I think the problem is, and it's kind of, kind of back to arts education, is that you know our education system is, is, is quite old and creaky, and actually was built at a time of like the industrial revolution. So you know things like the sciences and the maths and English were seen as vital, vital parts because at the t at the time, you know we were as a country trying to build and trying mm. to develop and move forward, and that was what the belief was. The arts were seen as, I suppose, you know, something to kind of listen to or engage with on a kind of another level, kind of mm -hmm. just kind of feeling mm -hmm. a bit bad or whatever. But uh, now, the, the, and the, the big problem is, is that because those those subjects are kind of, like I said, the core subjects and everything else is a foundation around it, it means that it's very, very hard to break certain Western thinking, and probably what global thinking. Um, and I find it really interesting that we all know this, and governments know mm. this, mm. and politicians know this, and they kind of will occasionally give lip service and have a dialogue about it, but nobody really has the chutzpah to kind of really kind of take it on. And I think it's because politicians are so currently obsessed with things like the legacy and you know, they'll take a system and they'll go, it works, but I'm going to put my own stamp on it, so it will start something new, you know. And because nobody's really got the kind of gumption about them to kind of just go, right, I'm going to take this and change it and work with it and do something totally different, we're kind of stuck. Yeah. Where there is a dialogue, you know, on, on social media, we're having one now in homes and stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, I think, we, I think we've covered about why the arts are are important because my life can you imagine a world where it kind of all stopped you know yeah. it all just stopped one day artistic mm -hmm. vision really did stop or they did really drama music art and etc and dance and the curriculum there'd be such an uproar I, I do think there'd be an, an absolute uproar yeah. you know I don't know what my life would be without stuff like drama and music and, and parents, you know, parents will say to me things to things to me like, you know, he's she's more confident now. Mm -hmm. Just that sentence. Mm -hmm. She's more confident now. And he goes, well, that's all it is. You don't have to be on the stage jumping around. Mm -hmm. You know, you just feel enriched as a person. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see if they did actually put that that provision and um, parents would probably be turning around and pulling their hair out if their kids become more enclosed and more communicative through mobile phones and technology <coughs> and so in terms of engaging and talking to each other. So. It's almost like you want them to um, imagine it, like um, if you could just show them what the world would be like without the arts, like imagine if you could just, like almost like a VR experience, they're just like yeah. imagine that this is the world without any arts <coughs> and they'll be like oh shit, 
We do need it. No, we need it. Yeah. 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 But but it's yeah. really yeah. Is it, if you think about kind of what it what the experience of being alive on the planet is, and then you think about how much of that is covered in the curriculum. You know, and a lot of these kids have experiences outside of the school in their lives, and then they come into the school. What do you do with those experiences, and how do they relate to other experiences, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I think you know, um, and and one of the one of the prejudices, and it's a very and, and we all do it, is we belittle the imagination. We think it's a fantasy. We think it's a, something that's actually not about confronting reality. We think it's, oh, it's all, we, you know. But actually, the imagination, Edward Bond would argue, for instance, the imagination, is, that is the thing that makes us human. It differentiates us from, the, from yeah, other yeah. animals. You know, it's an essential part of life, and you gain it through play. And, and what, it, what play does is offer an our safe environment to explore that. Yeah, absolutely. And one which it kind of nurtures the trust yeah. with the participants yeah. and sometimes the audience yeah. everybody's kind of complicit within that so you kind of walk away kind of it's like a workout isn't it that's oh, right. I feel after that yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a question I've uh, thought about uh, going off what Aisha said I've often thought about having like a blackout day and trying to organise a blackout day where there's just no art and when like, looking into how to do that I then realised that actually there'd just be nothing left because actually everything around us has been designed by someone. Like, no one would be able to wear any clothes because they've been designed by someone. There couldn't be music anywhere. And, yeah, I, th I think, like, that is possibly the only way that people are actually going to start noticing. Um, maybe the end of arts is the end of the world. Yes, but but in a sense, in a sense, there is something in that yeah, because yeah. we are in a cultural crisis as well as all the other crises we're in, like environmental, etc., etc., etc. Again, everything's been commoditized. We're in a cultural crisis. The fact that it's not in schools, that you know, that that, that that's you know, music is now like. It is not in schools as you know, in that sense, no one, not everyone has access to it, and that's a crisis. Mm -hmm. How do we, how can we create meaning and say what you know, what, what, what we think life is about and what it's for if we don't have the arts? But then it also creates division because of those that in the schools, oh, I got music lessons, I yeah. did dance, I did this, yeah. and then there's the other people that stand back and look, wow, I wish I could do that. Mm. And what potential are we stifling at that moment? Mm. Where, where could mm. they have been? Yeah. Mm. As, a, as an add-on, I've got a question from over <coughs> my shoulder, um, which is, if you could change one thing overnight that would affect the arts, what would you change and why? Mm. Which is an so, interesting yeah, so one. You so change. if you could change one thing overnight that would affect the arts, what would you change and why? Time machine thing. Sorry, like a time machine thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How realistic are we talking? Yeah. It could be like a magic wish that happens, you say it now and it happens tomorrow, or you could be going back in time and oh, changing. Okay, so, but, well, maybe then, based on what we've been talking about, that, that everybody got it. Mm. That makes sense? Mm. That everybody actually got it. Because then the dialogue and the discussion would then be shifting rather than talking about why it's not here and why it doesn't exist in the, in the way that we want it to. It would, the dialogue would be maybe about, okay, what are we going to do yeah. on a daily basis and using the, that, that creativity. So I suppose it would be a, a, that kind of like, like a cultural or global shift that suddenly one day people go, oh, yeah, we do need this. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking a change of perspective. A perspective, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if there's like a solution, but something to do with funding and money and possibilities so that t ticket prices either are zero yeah, yeah, yeah. or are to a point where so much people are able to access arts. That's bigger than what you do, yeah. isn't it? Now? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
to yeah, something about broadening audiences and making it accessible to be able to access arts and be able to come in and be invited and feel like you have a place. I would um, replace the military budget with an, uh, and make it an arts budget. And, <coughs> and as they say, or as I've read or seen the leaflet, is if they want another missile, they can go and have a, a jungle cell for it. <laughs> uh, and we'll and we'll distribute that money around the arts, and then you know every every place should have its own repertory theatre and theatre and education company, and you know etc etc. And absolutely bringing prices down and making these real community venues again. Mm. And the same with that in schools. Yeah. Giving schools more more funding money. But changing that, Change, you know, you'd, have yeah, to, yeah. you'd have to, you know, it's like bosses, aren't, yeah, bosses aren't turning around and going, oh, I'm going to use that to buy a load of books, just yeah. you know, or, or yeah, yeah. 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 Very interesting. Well, books are good. Yeah, Sam from behind the camera. Sam from behind the camera. Sam cam. Please turn the camera around quickly so we can see. No. <laughs> Who has been your biggest influence in your career choices? Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> really the look on my face of that. This is my thinking face. Um, <laughs> Of number of people, I think. Do you mean as in the initial now or initial or initial choice to actually get into the arts as a profession? It would have been my sister was a big part of it. it was a very big part of it. So she was a bit of a trailblazer in, in my family, I think. Um, and so when I was quite young, her and my mom actually, um, they kind of. <laughs> saw something in me, I think, running around the house, <laughs> dancing and singing and, you know, trying to put costumes or whatever things kids tend to do, you know. Um, but um, but they, they, I remember them kind of signing me up to the Crescent Youth Theatre when I was about 10 or 11. So that was, you know, that parental kind of familial support was kind of there, which I, I have never once looked back at and thought, you know, I, I recognise how lucky I am to have had that when so many people will go to their parents, I want to be here, and they go, I've never know, not known that, which is brilliant. Um, there was a music teacher when I was about 10 or 11 years old who um, said to me to audition for a, an opera at the Mac, and he said, because he noticed that I had a singing voice when I was a kid. And he kind of said, you know, go and... And so I'd, I'd say Mr Laws, you know, for example. So those key people that you encounter out there that kind of do that. So, so that was when I was a kid in terms of the drama. I suppose in teaching, I suppose again my sister because she was a teacher. And, um, and I kind of got a sense that I was kind of quite good at it, you know, from running workshops and doing stuff with people. And you just kind of go, oh, God. And just, oh, I kind of enjoyed it. But even now, I still need to feel inspired. Mm. You know, it doesn't stop. It's still me, and by both people that are older and obviously younger. You know, and I've, I've said to kids over the last 20 years, you know, my life, you, you've really inspired me. Because that's what keeps, I think, a lot of people teaching. Because mm. you're kind of always constantly thinking, you know, I love the kids on. You know, my year 11 group are, are, are a great bunch of people. You know, we have a laugh and we get on with it and we do the work and crack a few funnies and, you know, and a nickname for <laughs> certain kids. Why not, you know? And they're, um, but do they inspire me? It's because they let me get up in the morning and yeah. walk into a room and you go, all right, what are we doing today then? Mm. You know, so, yeah, so I'd say that, that's kind of where I am at the moment. Yeah. really always like at least once a month I'd always say to my mum, I wanna quit cello, I wanna do this, I wanna quit, I wanna quit, I wanna quit. <laughs> she would never let me. Um, 
and at the time I was like, oh, she hates me. She doesn't want me to have a good night. <laughs> so it's such his parties on Saturday, and I've got to go to the orchestra. Concerto concert. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to go to somebody's swimming party, but I had to go to orchestra instead. So um, I now look back and like think, you know, um, and that was just amazing. I had some amazing. Um, Teachers, shout out to Mr. Crabtree, my very first cello teacher, Miss Williams, my second cello teacher. But again, forced me, <laughs> made me do things. But now I'm like, like I listen to classic FM because that's my life. And it, I get, like, some people listen to classic FM to sleep. Like, oh, I've got a classical music to go to sleep. I can't do that. I get really, my brain is on fire. I get so excited by what I'm hearing. Um, and that kind of passion and excitement about that kind of music is drawn from those teachers. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anything leads me to where I am today, uh, but there's some definitely some inspirational people in Birmingham that have given me opportunities to do so many things and meet different people and give me advice that have put me on this path. Okay. Yeah, literally the same, because I can't, I don't think there's ever been like one person who I've um, looked at my entire life, I want to be like them, and like an actor or anyone. Um, I think it was just people around me, a bit like what you guys have said. Um, like even now, my granddad's like, still haven't seen you in Coronation Street. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my job doesn't really do that, but all right. Um, <laughs> but like just having that, um, that support is really cute. Um, even coming to uni, having people around you who have really um, kind of got their own passions and their own skills and seeing, being surrounded by that is really um, inspiring and it makes you want to be better. Um, and even now, where I work, um, seeing the experience people have, the skills that they have, how passionate they can be about education, about changing young people's lives, it makes you want to be like that. Um, and yeah, just like, like you said as well, it being around in Birmingham, seeing all the, the arts um, educators and all the people that are involved in the arts in Birmingham is, is inspirational. Um, and there's lots of crossovers as well. Um, yeah, uh, my, my brother Billy was who, who, who sort of middle was three of, three of us. So he he was um, an actor at, um, and writer at the Half Moon uh, Half Moon Theatre in, in in London in the early seventies, uh, uh, right through the seventies really. So I was around all that. I was going to, it was an old synagogue that was turned into a theatre, and I was around all that, and it was you know. And the, 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 the thing about all the theatre there, and particularly sort of fringe theatre, was very, it was very political, it was like, you know, so it was part of all that as well. So I would never be doing this if it, probably, if it wasn't for him, probably. But, uh, but like you, then when, as soon as I went to drama school, I mean, wow, you know, you were in this other kind of world of people. You know, growing up in the East End, you know, uh, it was one thing, going to football with my mates and all that, and all of a sudden I was, you know, with all this kind of bohemian, there were gay people, there were like, you know, what, what's going on here? And, and we, when we were at drama school, it was, it was huge. We were, you know, we wanted to change the world. And that was, and we would have arguments and it would be, you know, but it was like that intensity, we wanted to change the world. Yeah. And kind of that sort of stays with you in a sense, you know, and that's, that's why I'm... I've got no money. <laughs> 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 there you go. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I've got two questions actually. Um, do you feel like because as sort of as curators we're always consuming art, especially because so you as teachers and people who are teaching kids the art and because they're consuming so much art out there like, you know, they can go online and find I know, a DIY magazine of some punk band in Denmark or some stuff, something like that, or some film, indie film in Australia, and be like, oh, this is amazing, and they're so inspired by that. Do you feel like maybe institutes could look towards that DIY, look towards the internet, and say, hey, oh, that, that's interesting, let's just try and take those aspects? Um, my second question is, um, more minorities as well, how do we pr approach the arts to minorities? Because I did a media course, I just graduated this year, um, and one thing that I did this year was create a radio station, and it was regarded as like this big radio station, 
had a lot of minorities and big roles and we used to discuss in our station like why why are we having these discussions for like like and we would talk about our experiences and you know i had a girl in our class literally say um a white person shouldn't produce an asian show and that uh, it upset me because i was like i used to produce country shows and rock shows for white presenters for you know so there's this weird context um i feel like i'm mumbling about that so but no, but the point is like so like how do you approach minorities as well in terms of using rock and going out there? <coughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know about the, 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 in terms of the internet as another space. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a sort of something that's there. And I know it's hugely kind of mm. changed people's lives in lots of ways, but I'm kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you, you, yeah, you can put things I think the more. I'm all for make, making, you know, people widening their horizons, finding kind of indie films or whatever and all of that, you know, I think that's great, I think. Um, I, I do worry about kind of Netflix and all that and these, I can't put my finger on it yet, but, you know, people <laughs> like the, what they call box sets, <laughs> you know, and kind of how much, yeah. Yeah. I'm concerned about it, but I, don't, I can't quite tell you why. But it was like, <laughs> binge watching stuff. Yes, know, yeah, and that kind of, um, I don't know. I, I, one of the things is, is um, it's very, what's interesting, like in Sheffield, there are two theatres, the Crucible, <coughs> and the, uh, the, the, the theatre next door to the Crucible is kind of, it's the one that would bring in shows and you'd have the TV stars there and all that, and because they made the money. They'd also subsidise the crucible through that a little bit, but now they're not making the money, and I want the people are not going to the theatre. There's a vicious circle going yeah, on here. Yeah, the more yeah. people don't go, the more prices are going to have to go up. The yeah. more people don't go, you know. Yeah. Why are people not going? And, and I do worry about how much people are sort of shutting the doors and I'm going to watch ten hours of whatever. I think I do I do agree with that. Um, but I think there's just some things that you can't control and the internet and social media is something that you almost have to keep up with them to know what's going on. Um, so in terms of them like consuming arts, I think as long as it's safe and what they're consuming is safe, then I don't think it's a a problem because you know we don't really have a choice but to keep up with them um, because if you tell them not to do something you know it makes them want to do it more um, so yeah I think, I think yeah. <laughs> someone's sitting on my remote <laughs> something that I had to learn because as long as I am I didn't really I didn't really have internet growing up as a musician so when I was teaching music it was oh this look at this song that I've learned to play off YouTube and it's kind of like oh god <laughs> if I have to hear another riff on the Game of Thrones theme tune <laughs> or whatever it is that they've learned on the piano but then they've learned it haven't they? that's the thing yeah. I, l I learned that whatever the hook is that, then that's great. Oh, if that's yeah. if that's what draws you in, then I can say, okay, let's look at your technique now. Why don't we play that at a different speed so you can get the notes in properly? That I think that's a fantastic thing that the internet internet gives people opportunities um, yeah. to buy into art. Um, with diversity, um, I really think there's like a almost a two step thing, mm. where first thing is because um, I know for some ethnic backgrounds the arts is seen as a waste of time, not as something that you should see as a career for yourself. I think, first of all, enjoying arts is, the, is an important thing. Yes, okay, fine, if you don't want it as a career, that's cool, but show up to drama lessons, show up to dance after school, just engage with it, and if you enjoy it, and if you're good at it, then develop that skill and, and see how you go with that. And then if that's all that they do, I think that's something that we need to accept the first round, and then it's, they accepted it, they've gone on to do this, look at that person as a role model, and then that, for the, the lower generations going down, is something to aspire to, and that, yes, there's a viable career in this, 
So I think it's first of all mm. making sure that people see the value in it, and then from there having role models um, and aspirations and spirit to do the things. I think I think it's about dialogue. So I think both are about dialogue and awareness, and something you kind of touched about the hook that you know. And I think as you get older, sometimes you get quite set, you get quite set in your ways. And I was talking to my year 11 today. <laughs> I said, have any of you heard the term OK Boomer? <coughs> have you ever heard OK Boomer? Anybody heard that term? And a couple of kids were laughing, and the other rest of the class were like, mm, what's going on? And this term OK Boomer is apparently a, a, a phrase that lots of young people, straight millennials, have been using with people that are a little bit older, like baby boomers, as if to say, OK Boomer, you've had your shot. <laughs> We've got it now, just trust us to get on with it. You know? And I thought to myself, you know, they're right. And you have to, and you, we all have to get out of our way, out the way of ourselves all, all the time. And I think both with, like you were saying about the hook, and that's something that you said you've learned, where kids present things to you and you're going, but I'm thinking, yeah, but you're happy with it and you're going to run with that, and that, that's okay. But I think it also is the same with, with, with diversity. That, like you said, both sides have to be willing to, whatever, whatever the argument is or whatever the side is, have to kind of be willing to kind of sit and genuinely listen. Because at the end of the day, we, we all learn something from, a, from each other. Um, so I think it's about trying to create a kind of a, a, a dialogue. Does that make, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. 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 All sorts, you know. It, when, when I went in the, to, when I started going to, uh, drama school uh, in the late 70s and the 80s um, there, you know there were companies like gay sweatshop there were feminist companies uh, a lot of black act, black and Asian actors had to form their own companies to get work you know yeah because there was no you know you you know the, the, you wouldn't have seen the black actor playing Macbeth or uh, or, Lear or any of that that wouldn't have happened. You know, it, would, it was, it really was. So I don't know whether we're, uh, you know, on the one hand, I think, you know, I think there have been some really important battles that have been won. Um, that, in a sense, those companies don't exist anymore. Because I don't think there's a need for them, necessarily. Um, but we have to be on our guard in that sense. You know? And um, if the arts is, a, is partly about, you know, uh, Telling the story, the experience, and getting that kind of of, of uh, the whole community, then then we have to make sure that that's what we're getting. You know, I, I think I mean like you were saying about like the whole Netflix thing and mm. binge watching and, and, and all that, and I, I don't have a problem with it because of what mm. I'm discovering more and more is that it's there's a lot of quality material out yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I lose track of the amount. Of yeah. Have you watched that? Yeah, no, no. no. <laughs> oh my God, it's so good. Have you watched that as well? No, you're... so people are now, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And I think theatre, for example, has been quite clever, I think, because they've now started to try and bring in some of the production values, again, if you've mm. got the money. But again, it's a starting point. Mm. Or you, you cast a star actor, mm. because you know it's going to get bums on seats, but it might get yeah. a certain demographic in, in as well. Um, and, and I know, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always work, but, uh, you know, I, I think we sometimes have this perception with certain, certain like, vis I call it visual literature, so, like Netflix, and I call it visual literature, because we have this misnomer that of the whole, mum and dad used to sit and everybody would be around the telly watching, it's like, the reality was it wasn't really happening, you know, no. mum might be knitting and dad yeah. would be watching the sport, and now, Everybody actually is, I think, a lot more in, in, engaged with, with, say, television a bit more. Um, and it's so good. And after, well, actually what happens, I think, as well, is that, you know, like you said about YouTube, lots of kids will just watch, like, or, you know, I'll learn that hook. If they really want to learn it, they'll then go on and go on and they go on and go on. And they kind of fine-tune and gradually start to revive, refine their artistic pleasure or viewing pleasures or whatever, which is what we all do. Yeah, 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 it's what we all did, you know. So. I think just going from that as well, and what you said about um, almost not having a role model in terms of diversity is that there isn't enough um, mainstream theatre 
or mainstream television or mainstream music for of um, ethnic minorities showing them in the arts, um, which is actually why sometimes things like Netflix are good mm. because things like Queer Eye, I don't know if anyone's watched it. Or, Top, yeah. Boy. or Top Boy, yeah. which people yeah. keep saying you've got to watch, for yeah. example, which I know. So kind of showing um, people you know, actually, actually in the arts. Well, mirroring, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So just, I think, just having that role model in the mainstream needs is the thing that will start to show people that it's okay to go into those kind of things. I mean, that might have been okay to watch all ten seasons of Friends in one weekend. Nice. Are we saying that or not? That's your judgment. <laughs> but I think I think the do-it-yourself thing is really important. Uh, uh, you know, I think if there's one thing that I kind of I hope for as a uh, working on the course. Is that some some students are going to get together and form their own theatre company? Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's my real kind of and and sort of one of the things is is that interestingly, if you like, it's it's now become a kind of mainstream thing. But if you think about grime, you, know, you think about what those kids were doing, kind of in their bedrooms, on these council estates with a, a computer and a whatever, you know, and they were making their own, you know, and this whole music scene came out of that. Yeah. And it's worse on the estates. It's so yeah. hip hop yeah, in yeah, yeah. New York yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or, or punk yeah, in yeah, London. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's all, and it often comes from adversity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, whether you like it or not, often the best, the best songs that have ever been written is usually when somebody's going through some shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't want to be heard. I remember, it, I love Billy, Billy John, and I remember once watched him be interviewed, and he said, they said, why have you not released anything else? And he went, because I ran out of ideas and I think some of my contemporaries should stop. And he said, but I went into classical music. And he said, I always viewed rock and roll as being some, he said, he said classical music was the girl next door and rock and roll was some really grungy, dirty kind of girl on a motorbike, he said, who pulled up out front and went, come with me, son. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and he went, okay. And he went, okay. And he went, went to the girl next door, classical music, he jumped the bike, he went off and had a wild time. And then he came home. And classical music was still there, yeah. waiting. It's all probably romanticised, but I thought, what a really clever way of kind of looking yeah, at, yeah. at that kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. Definitely. Definitely. Right. Probably have to be our last question, as we are getting towards the end. But, Georgie, you have one? Uh, this is kind of a random question, maybe. Ask it. Um, in terms of being in a room in front of people that are potentially venturing into um, a career in arts and education, um, Kind of, what would you like to see out of the budding new people that are coming into arts and education? What are some things that you would really like maybe us to bring to the scene or would just like to see in arts and education that we could potentially do? And so we potentially be busy, but as in As in new people that are venturing into oh, okay. career office. Okay. With our backgrounds of maybe, or our generational things that we've experienced in life, what do you think is potentially missing, or just something that we could bring? I think I think you've got to define what your what you think education is for, what you think the arts are for, what you think the role of the artist in society is. You define that, and you've got to then bring it. And some of that you'll have to compromise because you'll be getting a funder say, "Well, I want you to do this," yeah. and you have to find a way of doing that and doing your thing. But actually, that's what it's about. It's not sort of not fulfilling the things that I didn't quite do, <laughs> but doing the things that you need to do. And I think that's that's what I'd like to see. Yeah, everything from you. Um, I think I'd say probably as much as possible not to slot into the mould that's already there. Arts education was just discussed really needs an overhaul, and I wouldn't want anybody to say, "Well, I'm just going to, you know, here's my other schools. What are they offering me? I'll take that cash and just go in, do my little delivery, and leave, and stick to whatever they want me to do." Absolutely disrupt it, but I think that's really pushing the boundary of where we're going to make progress. You, as a teacher, I'm going to make notes on everything you're about to say. That's where I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> echo <laughs> oh, yeah, everyone else. Uh, yeah, um, yeah um, so look at the system that you're going to go into and see what you can, can bring to it. 
and see what you can change within it. And don't be, don't be afraid, really, of, of doing stuff. And also, you can often find that you can come in with an idea um, and you can think no one's going to follow this, but you stay the course and, and think what goes around comes around and things come back in vogue and, and stuff. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think just bring that energy and try to always be open-minded. Mm-hmm. And like I was saying, they're getting out of the way yourself because what starts to happen is that people, I think, certainly artists, certainly uh, will develop their own kind of stand or take or philosophy. And, this, and I do think that as you get older, you, it can be very hard to kind of actually go, I need to listen mm-hmm. a little bit more, or watch or take on board this and shift with that, those sands a little bit and go with it a little bit, leading to it a little bit. It's not always such a bad thing. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's hard because I always feel like I'm still trying to do that. I'm still trying to see what people are, are wanting and what needs to be done. I think the best thing you can do is um, try and find where the gaps are yeah. and do as much kind of research into it. You can obviously arts and education is so vast. There's so much to it, um, but try and find where the holes are and where you can try and help fill those holes. Um, like even at Loudmouth, like we do, um, like relationship, sex, PSHE kind of education, and I just thought, you know, oh, we'll turn up to a school, do the performance, do some workshops, and that'll be fine. But actually, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. We do so much research into the curriculum, the new um, RSE 2020 guidance that's going to come out next year, um, safeguarding, or you know, there's so much more to it than than you think. So I think just try and be prepared to. Um, to like take it on like you've, like you've said and just fill in and find out where the gaps are first of all I think mm-hmm. I don't know. I'll be there with you <laughs> thank you very much uh, if you do have any questions that you're not brave enough to ask about everybody we do not have some time for chatting and networking um, so grab some food come and talk to our panellists uh, and also if you can we've got some evaluation stuff uh, that we have <laughs> Got on the door if you could fill that in for us. Um, thank you all very much for coming. I have a fresh Brilliant. And thank you very much uh, to Bobby, Asha, Deandra, and to you for being with us today. Thank you.